Okay, so tonight we're going to do day 37 and day 38. So we're on page 98 if you have the book. Day 37, we're going to talk about the study Bibles. <clears throat> study Bibles are great tools, and there are many of them out there. They're like a Bible and a Bible commentary in one. On each page of your study Bible, you'll find notes written alongside the text of the Bible. Often, these notes are below the Bible text, such that the top half of the page contains the Bible passage, and the bottom half of the page gives the notes that correspond to verses in the Bible passage. Sometimes the study notes are on the side of the page. Here are the study Bibles I use, and I recommend them all to you. So I, I have all of these. I've read all of them. I like all of them. <clears throat> First of all, the Quest Study Bible. This is my favorite. Most of the notes are in the form of questions and answers. So instead of just plain commentary, you know, what Jesus means by this is such and such. It, it asks a question, and then it answers it. These are the questions Christians should be asking as they read the Bible. The answers are outstanding. Now, we have time, so I'm going to pause a little bit here. Here is the Quest Study Bible. Of course, you can get it in leather, you know, or it doesn't have to look like that. But anyway... I just want to give you uh, some examples of, of how these questions and uh, answers work. So, so let me read uh, a few to you. In, in, and I'm, just, I'm not even going to turn a page in my Bible. I, I'm just opening here to 1 Peter chapters 2 and 3. Okay. Now, in chapter 2... Uh, he talks about uh, slaves, Peter does. And so here's one of the questions, and it's in a great big box, this big. Why doesn't the Bible condemn slavery? Isn't that a good question? And then here is quite a, a long answer to that. And the answer is extremely in insightful. Now, on the right-hand side of the page, it's the passage where he talks about husbands and wives. And one of the things he says to wives, Peter, in, in verses 3 and 4, don't let your adornment be the wearing of dresses and the braiding of your hair, you know, so forth. And so the question is, what's wrong with being stylish? And then it gives a really neat answer. And then in this same passage... Uh, it calls wives the weaker vessel. That's the old King James. This is the New International Version, and it calls her the weaker partner. And so the question is, why call wives the weaker partner? You know, in what sense are they weaker? And, and it gives a fabulous answer. And then uh, it says also in this uh, passage, you know, wives, be submissive to your husbands. And so in this case, there's a big box at the bottom. Isn't it chauvinistic to teach wives to submit? That sounds like a 21st century question, doesn't it? And here's a great big answer right here. Uh, you know, that, uh, the, like I say, these, these are the kind of questions Christians should be asking, and, and the answers are excellent. And then uh, one, one, one more, uh, it talks to husbands, and it says, live with your wives in an understanding way so that your prayers will not be hindered. And the question in the margin is, how are prayers hindered? And then, you know, it gives an answer. So from Genesis to Revelation, that's what the quest study Bible does. And I think, I, I would say, that I was more blessed personally reading the study notes in, in this study Bible 
than, than any other study Bible. Although I do love them all. <clears throat> Whoops. But okay, so there's a little sample. And then another one is the Life Application Bible. People love this study Bible because of the word application in its title. It's strong on application and its notes are easy to understand. Then we have the Serendipity Bible. This is designed for Bible study groups. If you wanna lead a Bible study group but don't know how you would lead the discussion, this is perfect. Each paragraph of scripture has three sections of questions that bring out the meaning of the passage. The three sections are, first, open. These are icebreaker questions that get you thinking about the themes in the passage. And then dig. These are questions that make you explore and study the passage. And then reflect. Questions that apply the passage to your life. Now, here is the Serendipity Bible right here. And just like I did with the Quest Study Bible, I'm going to give you an example of, of how they do this. Now, I'm on the page where, in John chapter 13, where Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. You remember that story. And he said, if I, your Lord and Master, wash your feet, you should wash the feet of one another. Now, <clears throat> the, the open, so now I'm going to read to you the, the three categories of questions. And uh, first of all, the open questions for just like opening the discussion. And in this edition of the Serendipity Bible, all the open questions have a cup of coffee pictured uh, in front of them. The idea is, these are the questions you ask when you just sit down and have coffee with a person, heart, pretty much even before you've opened the Bible. Well, anyway, so here they are. Listen to this. Imagine saying this to your Bible study group, and tonight you're going to study the passage of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. What were the special meals in your family? Thanksgiving? Sunday lunch? Birthday dinners? Christmas? Christmas? And what was usually served? Now you see that has nothing to do with the Bible text, but uh, uh, it's going to go on here. This is in the upper room where he washes the feet of the disciples. And after doing that, he's going to do the Last Supper. So this is kind of leading up to the. All right, next is, who would you nominate for the Mother Teresa Award in your family or church for selfless, tireless servanthood. So, you know, when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, he was showing what kind of a servant he was. So it asks that question. Okay, so, so much for the open questions, the icebreaker. Now we get the dig questions. And in this uh, version, uh, it's got a picture of like a, a Bible, just a sketch of a, a diagram of a Bible. So remember now, in the dig questions, it says questions that make you explore and study the passage. All right, so here we go. What does Jesus know that escapes the disciples' attention in verses 1, 3, and 11? So you, you have to look in your Bible at verses 1, 3, and 11. Find the answer. Hence, what impresses you about Jesus washing their feet? Question number two. If you were Peter, would you have reacted as he did? This is where he said, oh Lord, then don't just wash. First he said, don't wash my feet, Lord. No, and Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part in me. And Peter said, well, then not just my feet, but my whole body. So would you have reacted as he did? Why or why not? While Peter is taking the washing of his feet literally, what do you think Jesus meant by his statement in verse 9? And then, what did he mean by his statement in verse 10? So you have to look at verse 9. You have to look at verse 10 to find the answer to that. Here's another one. How does Jesus challenge their idea of what it means to be the chief followers 
of the Messiah, verses 12 to 17. What role reversals do you see here? So you have to read verses 12 to 17. All right, and then we have the reflect questions, the application questions. And here the symbol for it is just a diagram of a heart. So the, these questions now are set off, you know, of, you can see. All right, so here are the application questions. In your spiritual life, who is one person who has demonstrated what it means to wash feet? What did he or she do? Here's a second application question. Specifically, how will you put Jesus' teaching into practice in at least one relationship this week at home, work, or church? Yeah, but the question is, how will you put it into practice at church? So see, now here's my point. <clears throat> you don't have to prepare at all to lead a Bible study group. All you gotta do is use your serendipity Bible. And, and ho hopefully everybody else in the group can go out and buy a serendipity Bible too. And you can go through like, for example, you know, the whole book of John every, every week. You do, you do one of these sections and you do the open questions, the dig questions, and the reflect application questions. So this is super. It requires no preparation on the part of the uh, group leader. <clears throat> So let's, let's go on now. We've got uh, the Nelson Study Bible, excellent study notes written by a team of conservative Bible scholars. Then the NIV Study Bible, again, excellent study notes written by a team of conservative Bible scholars. Another one is the Reformation Study Bible, also known as the New Geneva Study Bible, those two study Bibles are exactly the same. The only thing that has changed is the title. Excellent study notes written by scholars who stand in the tradition of the 16th century Protestant Reformation. <clears throat> then the Ryrie Study Bible, all the notes are written by one scholar, Charles Ryrie. Then the MacArthur Study Bible, all the notes are written by Pastor John MacArthur. It appears to me that the study notes in the MacArthur Study Bible are identical to the commentary in the MacArthur Bible commentary. So you don't need both books. I have both books. And I have noticed this time and again, I'm very confident that these are absolutely identical all of the commentary in the MacArthur Bible commentary, it's all in the MacArthur Study Bible and vice versa. <laughs> so, and then Dake's Annotated Reference Bible, I should have brought this to show you. It's, it's extremely small print, and I think that's the only way you can get it. This contains probably the most study notes of any study Bible all are written by Finnis Dake. And his study notes are uh, just from one end of the map to the other. Uh, he, he tells you pretty much a lot more than you want to know. <laughs> but, it's, you know, still, okay. So, I recommend that you pick a study Bible. As you read through the Bible in one year, we've already covered that in a previous evening. Uh, so, so you'll be using your study Bible as more than a reference tool. If you invest 30 minutes each day, you can read through the entire Bible and all the study notes in one year. It will be a great blessing to you. You'll grow by leaps and bounds and so will your love for your Bible. Now tonight, uh, when Dan Lyons came in, I just happened to notice that he was carrying the uh, Jeremiah Study Bible. And I have never seen that before, and it's not, it's not in this list here, because I don't have it and I haven't read it and so forth. But obviously, that's by David Jeremiah, his notes in the margins and so forth, okay. So there's another one for you, I'm sure it's very good. Um, 
So anyway, so my recommendation then is that you not use your study Bible as just a tool. If you want to find out what such and such verse means, let's open the study Bible and see what the notes say about that. Instead, read it. And it seems to me that the number of words in all of the notes equal about the number of words in the Bible uh, for a typical study Bible, it's about the same. And that's why I say, if you read 30 minutes a day, you can read your whole Bible and all of the study notes in one year. Because if you remember a couple of weeks ago when I was teaching about how to read through the Bible in one year, uh, I said that it only takes 15 minutes a day. So you'd be you know, spending about 30 minutes and the other 15 minutes would be going through the study notes. So let me read now these little fillers I have. When children of God look into the word of God and see the Son of God, they are changed by the Spirit of God into the image of God. I love that. Warren Wearsby said that. And then here's something by Immanuel Kant, philosopher. The Bible is an inexhaustible fountain of all truths. The existence of the Bible is the greatest blessing that the human race has ever experienced. And Jerome said, ignorance of the Bible means ignorance of Christ. And then here's a story that I, I really love. An American soldier during World War II met a native on a remote island. The, the native could read and was holding a Bible. When the American soldier saw the Bible, he said, we educated people no longer put any faith in that book. The native was from a tribe of former cannibals and he replied well it's a good thing that we put faith in this book or you would have been eaten by my people today <laughs> all right <clears throat> that's what i have to say about the study bibles now um would anyone like to ask a question dake Dake. Yeah. It's very old. It's only in the King James. But yeah, you can, you can buy that. If you go to uh, <clears throat> Amazon.com and type in Dake's Study Bible, it'll, it'll come right up, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah he, I think he was an American. <clears throat> By the way, you know, I can show it to you in my office, you know, sometime. Uh, Ask me and come in and I'll show it to you. It, it is in, in small print and I, I don't think you can get it in large print. It's one of those things that <clears throat> probably comes only in one format. King James, small print, and all of the pages are the same. <clears throat> but uh, it, it is jam-packed with with uh, study notes and um, sometimes he really goes far out there talking about some kind of theme. Any other questions? <clears throat> Could you read, where are the, the different versions on these? I know the question, but could you just read the... Yeah. Bible, the, the uh, my life application Bible is the uh, New Living Translation, but I think that you can get the Life Application Bible in several different versions. Most of the study Bibles, I think, you can probably get only in one version. But there are a couple of study Bibles, several, I think, that you can get in several versions. You can pick. And a place like christianbook.com is a good place to see what your uh, choices are. You go to christianbook.com and then you type into the uh, window there something like Serendipity Bible and it'll come up and you'll see. The, the Serendipity Bible is the New International Version, the one I have. And I, I don't know if it comes in different versions. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. 
but a place like christianbook.com would be able to tell you what your choices are if you have any choices about that. <clears throat> any other questions? All right, then, we have one more lesson tonight. We'll turn the page, day 38. <clears throat> Why you need a Bible concordance and how to use one. Okay, a Bible concordance is an alphabetical index to the main words in the Bible with references to key passages in which each of those words occurs. A concordance is useful for two main things. First, you need a concordance when you can remember some or all of the words in a verse but can't remember where in the Bible those verses are found. Um, suppose you're thinking of a verse that says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. You're sure you've read that in the Bible somewhere, but you can't remember what book, chapter, and verse it comes from. Stop right there. I didn't pick that phrase out of thin air. Uh, some of you will remember Delia Gonzalez, one of our members. She actually came to me one day with that exact question. Pastor Tom, where does it say in the Bible, the Lord is my rock and my fortress? I know I've read it somewhere, but I, I can't find, I don't know where it is. Do you, can, do you, do you know where it is? <laughs> so I got out my Bible <clears throat> concordance. She was in my office and showed her. And so, th so this is a real, real life uh, example. Dear Delia, she's with the Lord now. Okay, so we continue on here. The first thing you should do is focus on an unusual word in the statement you can remember. Probably the most unusual word in our sample line that you can remember, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, is the word fortress. Later, I'll explain why you should focus on an unusual word. Second, <clears throat> look up that word in your concordance. <clears throat> it will be listed alphabetically. You may see, in other, in other words, a fortress will be listed under the F. You know, it goes A to Z in your concordance. Uh, you may see other words similar to it. In our example, fortress, there is also an entry for the word fortresses. But the verse you're thinking of has the word in the singular, not in the plural. So be careful not to focus on the wrong word. Once you find the word you're looking for, you'll see a list of verses in which your word, in this case, fortress, is found. This brings us to our third step. Read that list of verses under your word and find the verse that contains the statement you remember. They will be listed in the order in which they occur in the Bible, Genesis through Revelation. You'll read entries like these. <clears throat> 2 Samuel 5, 7, David conquered the F of Zion, so that's the fortress of Zion. 2 Samuel 22, 2, the Lord is my rock and my F, my fortress. Psalm 28, 8, a fortress of salvation for his people. Psalm 94, 22, the Lord has become my fortress. Three things stand out here. First, the books of the Bible are abbreviated. So you'll have to get used to that. Second, the letter F in each verse stands for fortress. That's because it's already listed under that heading. So they just make it simple for themselves. They save space in their book and they just use the word, the letter F. Third, only part of each verse is quoted. The verse you're looking for is the one from 2 Samuel 22, 2. Now you can match the words you remember with the book, chapter, and verse you forgot. And you'll be able to say, 2 Samuel 22, 2 says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. 
The reason you want to focus on an unusual word in the line you can remember is so that you can keep to a minimum the list of verses you have to read in your concordance before you find the one you're looking for. That's why you picked the unusual word fortress. For example, if you had picked the word rock, or let's say you picked the word Lord, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. Do you know how many times the word Lord occurs in the Bible? It's, it's more than 7,000 times. In the Old Testament alone, you don't want to wade through 7,000 verses to find your verse you're looking for. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. So th that's too usual of a word. You want to find an unusual word. Okay. Um, a second reason you need a Bible concordance is that it can help you survey what the Bible says about specific words. For example, you can look up the word love in your concordance and read verses in the Bible that contain that word. This can be an inspirational exercise because it will give you a good picture of what the Bible teaches about love. Of course, you can also do this with any other word in the Bible. An exhaustive concordance lists every word in the Bible, including words like a and he is and the. In addition, an exhaustive concordance will list every verse in which every word in the Bible is found. These exhaustive concordances are huge books and each one deals with one translation of the Bible. You can choose between concordances covering several Bible translations. Concordances that do not include the word exhaustive in their title are smaller and cover just the highlights of the Bible. Okay. Here is an exhaustive concordance of the Bible right there. It's called uh, Strong's uh, Concordance. Doesn't say exhaustive in the title, but it is. Now, you can kind of tell how small the print is, you know. And for example, you really can look up the word the in this concordance. And it might have, uh, I'll just guess, 60 pages. And on each page you've got three columns. And each column, I'm just gonna guess, is uh, 100 lines. You know, and you might have 60 pages, or, or thir I, don't, I don't know, 15 pages, whatever it is, telling you all the verses in the Bible where the word the occurs, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so. So this is one you can get, and this is the first one I ever got. I got this one when I was a young man. And then uh, the New American Standard Bible got translated. I think that was like in the 1970s. And that was a newer version of the Bible, so I you know, started reading it and so forth. And then they came out with the New American Standard Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. So this does exactly the same thing. It also has three columns on every page, maybe 100 lines, I don't know, 80 lines, whatever, per column, and uh, a zillion pages in this book. <laughs> you know, and it covers every single word, in the, the word uh, you know, how many times does uh, occur a you know in the Bible it's all in here well then I got into the New International Version and here's the NIV exhaustive concordance of the Bible and I probably don't have to open it but there it is same thing they do the same format three columns small print and you can tell that each one of these exhaustive concordances is about the you know same size the only difference is the, the version of the Bible you're, you're looking for. So that's uh, 
that. Now let's go on. Many Bibles have a concordance in the back of them after the book of Revelation. Virtually every study Bible has one in the back. And many non-study Bibles also include them. The concordance in the back of a Bible, concordances in the back of a Bible tend to be brief. And that lowers the odds that you'll be able to find the verse you're looking for. Now here are, here are just two examples. You can see this Bible is kind of falling apart. This Bible was given to me when I graduated from the third grade. And you know, third grade in church is when you go from primary Sunday school into junior, you know, the juniors. So my church gave me this Bible when I moved from third, to, uh, let's see, is, is, is that, no, you know, uh, let, me, let me double check here. No, no, I'm wrong about that. Sorry, uh, I got this when I graduated from junior high school. Okay. Eighth grade, now I'm going into high school, so the church gave all of us students one of these. Well, anyway, in the back of this Bible, sure enough, there is a concordance. There it is, right there. And it, it's brief, you know, you, you can't find every, for example, if you wanted to look up that sample I told you about, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, you look for fortress in here, it, it might not even be in this, the word fortress. And if it is, just maybe they won't list the entry you're looking for, so you can't always find it because it's not an exhaustive concordance of the Bible. And then here, here's another one. This is the uh, Gospel Transformation Bible, English Standard Version. And just to say, you know, this uh, has a concordance in the back of it. This, by the way, is a study Bible that wasn't even produced when I wrote my book, and so I don't have it in here as a, um, one of the study Bibles. But the Gospel Transformation Bible, it is a study Bible. So anyway, so there are, you know, you may have a concordance in the back of your Bible and maybe you don't even know it. Possibly. Okay. If you buy an exhaustive concordance, you'll be able to use it to do a few additional things. First, you can count the number of times a certain word, such as faith, prayer, hope, or any other word, occurs in the Bible. Second, you can count how many times certain phrases, such as the fear of the Lord, or God Almighty, or do not be afraid, are found in the Bible. You'll be able to confirm that certain words that describe biblical teachings are not found in the Bible. Examples are the words rapture and trinity. If you look those up, even in an exhaustive Concordance, you won't find them. They're, they're not in the Bible. They're not in an exhaustive concordance, so they're not in the Bible. Still, they do describe teachings in the Bible. So we use the words. And then you'll notice that in each verse you're looking at, the key word has been given a number. That number links you to the same numbered words in the Hebrew dictionary for the words in the Old Testament, and Greek dictionary for the words in the New Testament in the back of the concordance. So you can study the Hebrew and Greek meanings behind the English words. Often, people in the church I serve ask me where a certain statement is found in the Bible. If I can't recall from memory where their statement is found, I pull my concordance off the bookshelf and within a minute tell them where their verse is found. Then I notice a look on their faces that says, what was that you just did? How did that book help you find my verse so quickly? Such people are unacquainted with a Bible concordance, but I don't want you to be unacquainted with it. Get one and you'll find yourself using it regularly and loving your Bible more. Okay, little poem here. Within this wondrous volume lies the mystery of mysteries. Happiest they of human race to whom their God has given grace. 
to read, to learn, to hope, to pray, to lift the latch and find the way. And better had they ne'er been born who read to doubt or read to scorn, namely read the Bible. Now, okay, so that's it. But let me also just say here, you know, with uh, the internet, you almost kind of don't need a Bible concordance at all. Let's just say you're looking for that verse, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. All you got to do is go to google.com, type in the Lord is my rock and my fortress, and your book, chapter, and verse will come right up. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, if you have your computer and on the internet, uh, you don't exactly need it for that purpose. But, but still, you would need it for example, if you want to find out how many times in the Gospel of John the word love occurs. You know, you, you, you look love in your concor exhaustive concordance and then just look at the verses coming from John and count them up. You know, so if you type that question into Google, you might get the answer and uh, you might not. I, I'm not sure. But anyway. All right, any, any questions about concordances. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yep. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, in our final session two weeks from tonight, we're going to talk about why you need a Bible commentary and how to use one similar to the concordance thing, except where it's a commentary. And then the final one is why you need a Bible dictionary and how to use one. And then we're going to look at the 10 verses in Psalm 119 that say, how David loves the word of God. There are 10 passages, verses, in, all in the same psalm, Psalm 119. Notice I didn't say in the same chapter. Psalm doesn't have chapters. It has psalms. It's the book of psalms. We covered that earlier in our lessons some weeks ago. But anyway, 10, ten verses in that psalm where he says that he loves God's word, and, and we'll look at all 10 of them. So we'll do all that uh, two weeks from tonight. All right, so <clears throat> thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for your kind attention. Let's pray now. Lord, we, we wanna be good students of your word. And uh, so thank you for this help that we've learned about tonight from study Bibles and concordances. And our, our request is, Lord, that we can just be very uh, much more adept uh, and skillful when we use the Bible compared to uh, what, what we used to be. And in that way, that we can be growing and more careful in our use of scripture because it's your holy word. So thank you, Lord, for being with us here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.